Good morning, church. It's good to see everybody. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. Our passage today is Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Mark 6, verses 1 through 6. Hear now the word of God. And he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. May God bless the reading of his word and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And we'll dive into our passage today. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, it has been good, even up to this point, to be in your house, to be among your people, to worship you, to hear, to pray, and to sing your truths, Lord. I pray that that would continue in the preaching of your word. I pray that you would guard me from error. I pray that you would get the preacher out of the way so that you can speak to each of us, your people. We thank you for this privilege of diving into your word, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it was the fall of 2009, and her name was Kelly Ann Waltz. And sadly, she died one of the most tragic deaths imaginable. You see, Kelly, her husband Michael, and their children lived on some property about 20 miles northeast of Allentown, Pennsylvania. They had a good life. They enjoyed nature and the outdoors, as well as different family hobbies, one of those hobbies being their animals, and not just any animals. The Waltz family were licensed exotic animal keepers. They had all sorts of creatures on their rural property, everything from mountain lions to jaguars to tigers and leopards and all other sorts of big cats. And they'd grown quite fond of their animals over the years, and they viewed them like big pets, right? Like any exotic animal owner tends to do. They were especially fond, though, of one of the biggest members of their pet family, a 350-pound black bear who stayed in a 15 by 15 steel and concrete cage. Better believe it, right? Well, one evening, as they went about their normal chores, Kelly decided it was time to clean out the bear cage. Now, normally people will use some sort of divider when they need to enter these large cages for any reason, but on this particular night, Kelly felt comfortable enough to go ahead and go in with the bear to clean the cage. They had a a history, after all. She was familiar. She was comfortable with the animal and with this process. They did it every night. One article I read says that she decided to throw some, some dog food over to the side of the cage to distract him for a few minutes as she went in to clean. But as you can imagine, things did not go quite as she expected. Kelly, then age 37, was pronounced dead at the scene after being mauled to death by this powerful black bear. 
Reports say that her children and neighbors helplessly screamed and watched in horror as this attack took place. That is until one of the neighbors was able to shoot and kill the bear in the middle of the attack. But it was too little, too late. And sadly, this sort of thing happens all too often with exotic animal lovers, the, the coyote Petersons of the world, the crocodile hunter types, right? They, they typically begin with much caution and much care as they approach these beasts, yet as they become more familiar, they begin to get comfortable. They begin to lose sight of the actual power that they're dealing with in these massive wild creatures. Their awareness is dulled as their familiarity increases. We've all heard that famous saying, familiarity breeds contempt. The idea is that the closer your proximity to something or someone, the less you tend to respect that thing or person. The more common it is, the less honor and reverence you ascribe to it. Familiarity breeds contempt. And I think you could say that was true of Kelly Ann Waltz. She had gotten a little too familiar with this powerful creature and likewise failed to recognize who he really was and what he was truly capable of. And I think we could also say that familiar, familiarity bred contempt for a little town in Israel about 2,000 years ago, the town where the most powerful and influential human being who's ever lived grew up. And Mark is going to help us see this reality as we dive into our passage today in Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, in a sermon I'm simply titling Familiarity Breeds Contempt. Familiarity Breeds Contempt. Let's go ahead and, if you haven't already, open your Bibles to Mark 6, start in verse 1. So it begins this way. It says, he went away from there. Now, remember last week, if you weren't with us, we, we left Jesus in Capernaum which had functioned as his home base throughout the Galilean ministry. Capernaum was likely the hometown of most of the disciples. Capernaum was where Jesus had taught the kingdom parables, right, off the shore. He was teaching about the kingdom of God in chapter 4. Then in chapter 5, he and the disciples traveled east across the Sea of Galilee to the foreign pagan land of the Gerasenes. And then last week, they traveled back to Capernaum, where we met Jairus and his daughter, as well as that woman with the issue of blood. That was back in Capernaum. And so he, he's left there now, and he came to his hometown, the text says. His hometown, and his disciples followed him. So now Jesus travels from Capernaum, about 20 miles southwest, to his hometown of Nazareth. Nazareth. I remember Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the city of David. Much of his ministry took place around the Sea of Galilee and in the capital city of Jerusalem. But we can't forget that the majority of Jesus' upbringing, his, his growing up, actually happened in a small town called Nazareth. Remember what we saw back in chapter 1. Mark 1, verse 9 says, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Later in chapter 1, a demon-possessed man runs up to Jesus, right? And what does he say? What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Okay, so our Lord was commonly known as a Nazarene. Now, Nazareth was a small town in the hill country, about halfway between the Mediterranean Sea to the west and the Sea of Galilee to the east, Likely no more than a few hundred people lived there, right? Many of whom were likely related. Nazareth was your, your typical, very, very small town. This is why Nathaniel, you remember in John chapter 1, Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? John 1, 46, right? So this, this small town has, has a small reputation. So this Jesus is, is now coming to his, his home, back to good old Nazareth. It's a homecoming, you could say. 
And notice what Mark adds. It says that his disciples followed him there. This is what disciples do after all. They follow. They, they learn. And lately, they've been learning a lot about the power and the might of the Lord Jesus. Right? Think about what they've witnessed in the matter of a, a few short days. They have watched Jesus literally rebuke and correct the weather in the calming of the storm. Remember that? They watched Jesus cast a legion of demons out of a man into a herd of pigs. You don't forget that sort of a thing, right? Then they crossed the sea again and watched their teacher miraculously heal a woman who had an issue of blood for over 12 years. And then he literally raised a little girl from death to life. These are some mighty works of power, you might say. Mighty works of sovereign authority. And so you might say they've been on a trajectory of success lately. Ministry success. If you can bring them back from the dead, I'd call that success. Jesus has demonstrated his identity in some powerful ways. And people are being blessed by him left and right. I don't know about you, but in my mind, if we're following Jesus and I hear the next stop is his hometown, I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'm thinking, let the good times roll, right? This is probably going to go well, right? This is, this is probably going to be an easy one. Surely they'll, they'll roll out the red carpet for Jesus, won't they? Right? I've never been to this podunk town, but surely Jesus is about to do something awesome, you would think. And likewise, the first century readers of Mark's gospel in context would be thinking similarly. We've seen some amazing stuff so far. Surely the success of Jesus' ministry is going to continue at his homecoming. There might be a natural optimistic expectation here. But they're about to be surprised as they enter this tiny town in the hills. So they arrive in Nazareth. Look at verse 2 with me. Verse 2. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. So Jesus had a developing reputation as a teacher. Right? So he's invited to be the guest lecturer of the synagogue in the Sabbath that day. It would have been common. And it says, many who heard him were astonished. They were astonished. They were amazed, right? We're met with this amazed, shocked crowd of Nazarene neighbors and family here. They're astounded. They're taken back. Yet the astonishment we see isn't exactly the kind you might expect. It's, it's not a positive amazement. It's not full of faith, but rather full of question and doubt. And they list their questions here. Where did this man get these things, they say? What is the wisdom given to him? And how are such mighty works done by his hands? Now let's think about these questions for a minute. Where did this man get these things? First of all, they refer to him as this man. You have to do this if you say that. Where did this man get these things, right? This, this regular common guy. Where did he get these teachings? In other words, he's a nobody, right? He, he doesn't have credentials. He's, he's never had a, a degree. He doesn't have an MDiv from Rabbi so-and-so, right? Where did, where did this man get this wisdom? And then it says, what is the wisdom given to him? Okay, so they clearly acknowledge, they, they recognize that he's, he's teaching with authority, with wisdom. And we see this everywhere in the Gospels, by the way. When, when Jesus speaks in the towns and the synagogues, people's jaws drop. They're astounded. They're dumbfounded by the wisdom pouring forth from his mouth. So they recognize that it's truth. They recognize that it's wisdom being spoken. But then they question where it comes from. Where did he get it? Right? Then they say, how, how are such mighty works done by his hands? Now, verse 5 is going to tell us that no mighty works were done by his hands in that place. And so we have to assume this is, this is hearsay. Right? They, they've heard, again, about the reputation of Jesus. They've heard about the powerful works of the Lord. Again, Jesus had a growing reputation. They're hearing about his healings and his exorcisms. 
And so we've, we've got some very curious Nazarenes here. They've got a lot of questions. They recognize the, the goodness, the wisdom, the power of Jesus, but they're failing to connect the dots between his works and his identity, his works and his person. Their questions are full of doubt and unbelief, and this becomes more evident as we keep reading. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? All right, so, so scholars differ on how to translate this Greek phrase. Some, the minority, take, take the view that Mark is essentially saying, is not this the carpenter's son? Speaking of Joseph, the son of Mary. While other theologians interpret it as, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? Mary, speaking of Jesus. So I think the latter is the more accurate, natural reading. Most English translations give us this, which is interesting for us because it indicates a certain amount of disrespect in this question, a certain amount of disrespect from the people. Why? Well, because in Jewish culture of that day, a man would have always been addressed as son of his father, son of his Father, even if his father had already passed away, right? You think of the example, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, Simon, son of Jonas, right? So, so commentators seem to agree that this is actually an insulting way of identifying Jesus. One author puts it this way. He says, rumors to the effect, remember, it's a small town, lots of rumors, lots of gossip, rumors to the effect that Jesus was illegitimate, appear to have circulated in his own lifetime, and may lie behind this reference as well. The rhetor rhetorical question of the people indicates that they know Jesus only in a superficial way, and they find no reason to believe that he possesses the anointment of God, end quote. And you can hear, you can hear that unbelief in their questions. And again, in this case, familiarity I would say, had bred some contempt, right? They continue. They say, isn't this, isn't this the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? In other words, isn't this that neighborhood kid with all those siblings, right? Yeah, yeah, the one, the one with the suspicious biological father situation, you remember that? Right? Yeah, yeah, I remember that family growing up, Mary's virgin birth, right? This is how the Nazarenes are speaking here. Yeah, I recognize him. Yeah, I know him. And they took offense at him, the text says. They took offense at him. The word there in the Greek is, let's see if I can say it, askandalizanto. I thought that was fun, so I'm going to say it again. Askandalizanto. Say that with me. A scandalizanto. Now you know Greek. Isn't that cool? Right? You hear the word. What, what, what word do you hear in there? Scandal. Scandalized, right? right? It carries the meaning of, of outrage, of horror. They take offense. They're, they're disgusted by this man. They were scandalized by Jesus. They were tripped up. They were confused. And they were offended by his claims and his presence among them. Not exactly the, the positive, warm homecoming you would hope for, right? And so this is, their, this is their faithless response to the Lord. But now let's look at his response to them. Let's look at his response to them. Verse 4. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household, right? So this, this is a saying, this is a truism that, Jew, that, that Jews and Gentiles would have recognized, a common saying back then, right? The idea is that a prophet should expect honor and respect as he goes about proclaiming his message in various places. But when that message comes to his hometown, where he grew up, where, where he's well known, the honor and the respect goes out the window, this is what we see in Jesus' homecoming in Nazareth, right? His popularity, by the way, is growing throughout Israel broadly, 
right? His works and words are, are making an impact even as far as Gentile territory now. People are coming to him, as we saw last week, they're coming to him in faith, believing that he is who he says that he is. Yet, as he returns to his people, those who watched him grow up as a boy, those who knew his family history, they were filled not with faith, but with doubt, with unbelief. Now, remember back in chapter 3, when we first met Jesus' biological family. You remember that? We assumed they would be all for Jesus' ministry, right, and his message. But we soon learned that they were actually ashamed of Jesus. Look with me quickly. Mark 3, verse 21. <clears throat> Mark 3, 21. And, and it says, And when his family heard that, that he was in town, they went out to seize him. So they left Nazareth, came out of the hills, and went out to Capernaum by the sea. They went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. This is his family, right? So now, now Jesus is back in Nazareth, his old stomping grounds, and he's, he's met with faithlessness and rejection, not only by his family, but by his friends and neighbors as well. What a discouraging moment this had to be for Jesus. Can you imagine that? Just imagine walking those, those old streets you used to play on with your, with your siblings. Imagine seeing those same old familiar faces that helped raise you, and now all of them have turned their back on you because of who you really are. This had to be an emotional moment for Jesus, to say the least. Now let's look at the results in verse 5. Let's look at the results. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled because of their unbelief. Now these are some interesting comments Mark makes here about Jesus' response to Nazareth. We need to read these carefully. Okay, first of all, it says that he could do no mighty work there. That might strike us a little funny, right? We need to be careful not to over or under read the text here. What do I mean? Well, to, to over read the text, to load more into it that, than it's actually willing to carry, we would be saying Jesus tried to do a mighty work there. He really wanted to do a mighty work there, but he was hindered, he was shackled like a bear in a cage by the unbelief of the people. Okay, that would be an over-reading. That would be an over-emphasis on the word could, right? Saying that it was physically, spiritually impossible for Jesus to do a work of power there. You might, you might have heard preachers say something like this. See, see there's the proof. Mark chapter 6, right? The, the one thing the Son of God cannot do is override your unbelief. To which I say, talk to Paul about that and how that happened on the road to Damascus. The line of Judah does as he pleases. Amen? Amen? Amen. God does what he wants. Okay, so we don't need to overread the text, but we also don't want to undersell it either. And by that I mean we, we just blow past it, we ignore the words on the page in an attempt to preserve the power of Christ. So we say, well, we don't want him to look weak, so we ignore the fact that it literally says he was not able to do a mighty work there. We need to pay attention to that. Right? We want to take the passage at face value with everything else that we know from Scripture intact and accept the words on the page that he could do no mighty work work there. That means something. It means something to Mark. It means something to the Holy Spirit. And one commentator is helpful here. He, he puts it this way. He says, the statement should not trouble contemporary Christians. God and his son could do anything, but they have chosen to limit themselves in accordance to human response. They have chosen to limit themselves in accordance to human response. Response, and I think this is a true statement. 
made me think of James 4.2, for example. Right? You have not because you ask not. You have not. You actually have not because you ask not. That means something in the word of God. God is sovereign over not only the ends, but also the means. God uses means, therefore, to accomplish his will and his purposes. Think about it. God, God doesn't want, only want to bless his people. He does. But he wants to bless them in response to their prayers for blessing. Is that not true of God? Right? God doesn't merely want to heal people. He's designed the world so that his healing often comes in response to the request for that healing from those who trust him. And now think about the context of this passage. We've just heard Jesus say to, to a bleeding woman, Mark 5, 34, and he said to her, daughter, your faith, your instrumental faith, remember from last week, has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now we're in the very next story, very next chapter, and we unsurprisingly see that their, their lack of faith limits what God does for them by way of miracles by way of acts of power. And so Mark is on a clear theme here. He's, he's contrasting those who have faith and those who do not. Those who believe in the Lord and those who reject him. We've seen a lot of faith lately. We've seen a lot of belief lately, which has resulted in much miraculous work. Now we're seeing a lot of doubt and a lot of unbelief permeating through this little town. And Therefore, there are almost no miracles. It should make sense, right? But again, we need to read carefully because it does not say that not a single person was healed or blessed by Jesus' visit, right? Do you see that? Jesus did lay his hands on a few sick people, and he did heal some. So Mark's saying, I believe, in comparison to the mighty works of power that we've seen up to this point in this story, his works in Nazareth are minimal at best, right? Jesus has calmed raging seas, silenced demons, healed a woman who's bled for 12 years, and raised a girl back to life. These are powerful works. Yet in Nazareth, on the other hand, he heals a couple here and there, but otherwise it's sparse and it remains dark. Right? This was, and this was directly connected to the unbelief of the people. Now let's look now at the conclusion of our text in verse 6. Conclusion of our text. It says, And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went about among the villages teaching. Now we've heard many words like marveled, amazed, astonished throughout Mark's gospel so far. And it's going to be very rare, though, for us to see Jesus himself marvel or be amazed or shocked at anything or anyone. This is actually the only occasion in Mark where Jesus is described as marveling at something or someone. And I think that teaches us a lot about how, how strong, how persistent the, the lack of faith was in Nazareth. It was a big deal. It, it, it's enough to shock Jesus, to, to allow him to be taken back to their blindness and the thickness of their unbelief, right? And by the way, that's, that's the end of the passage, right? That's the, that's the sad conclusion to our great homecoming visit. That's the last we'll hear about Nazareth, that little faithless town in the hills. And so what, what was it that would cause even Jesus to marvel what was it? What kind of unbelief are we talking about here? Well, I want us to think again about the, the essential problems the Nazarenes had. What was, what was tripping them up? If you were to boil it down, what were their primary, the primary flaws in their thinking? I have three for us. For one, they detached the goodness of Christ from the true person of Christ. They detached the goodness of Christ from the true person of Christ. Look back with me again at verse 2. They said, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? And how are such mighty works done by his hand? 
And again, they, they, they acknowledge that what he was teaching is true, right, and good. They acknowledge that it is indeed wisdom, and it is authoritative teaching. They acknowledge that there is unquestionable divine wisdom pouring forth from his mouth. They, they grant that. And so they, they assume that this wisdom must have come from somewhere else. And they, they even acknowledge and embrace the works that he's become famous for are mighty, powerful works. They describe them that way. They don't reject any of this. They acknowledge and embrace all of the good content that Jesus was producing, but their problem is that they disconnect these good things from the true person responsible for the good things, right? They want to, to chew the meat and spit out the bones. They're, they're fine calling it true wisdom, works of power. They just won't accept the fact that Jesus is the Christ responsible for them. And so the first problem was that they were detaching the goodness of Christ from the true person of Christ. Secondly, the second problem they had was that their, their familiarity with Jesus was actually blinding them from his true identity. Their familiarity, their over-familiarity with Jesus was blinding them from his true identity. Think about it. After the, their, their series of questions about Christ's wisdom and teaching and power, they get personal, don't they? Start talking about his job and his family. Isn't that the carpenter? Isn't that Mary's boy? Right? right? Isn't that, that, that the one who works with wood and stone? He's always over there tinkering away. Right? We've known him for years. We know his mom and siblings. They're longtime residents of Nazareth. You see, the problem here is that they were, they were so comfortable and familiar with Jesus on a human level that they, they were unable to believe in his divine identity. They couldn't see it. Pastor John MacArthur puts it this way. He says, the residents of Nazareth were deeply offended at Jesus posturing himself as some great teacher because of his ordinary background, his limited formal education, and his lack of an officially sanctioned religious position, end quote. So it was unrealistic for them to, to think that someone so common, so familiar, so local could possibly be the long-awaited Messiah Israel had always been waiting for. Impossible. Even though, if they'd been paying attention to their Bibles, if they'd been reading God's Word, they would know that Jesus, this, this common man, is exactly the sort of guy they should have had an eye out for. Think of Isaiah 50, uh, 53. Isaiah 53, verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces... He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Right? So didn't the prophet, 700 years prior, didn't the prophet say that the Messiah would be a common man who wasn't much to look at? I think he did. I think he did. Didn't God prepare the world for an average-looking Messiah and Savior? He did. Yet Nazareth had become so familiar with the presence of Jesus, they couldn't see that the Son of God was looking them in the eye. This is the definition of blindness, you would say. For them, familiarity had bred contempt, and Christ's true identity was distorted. And finally, the third problem the Nazarenes had in our passage today. This is the crucial one. It says, when they were finally confronted with Christ's true identity, they were offended by it. They were offended by the truth of Christ. Remember, they were scandalized. They were tripped up by his words and his claims. They embraced him when they, when they thought he was just the neighborhood kid, right, that he'd always been. But once he claimed something more, they weren't having it. They were offended by him. They were face to face with the creator, the Lord of glory. Think about that. 
And yet they were offended rather than worshipful. They were disgusted rather than joyful. They were filled with unbelief rather than faith. And so as we, as we come off of a pretty sad, discouraging text today, saints, and in light of these three fundamental flaws of Nazareth, I want to close by exhorting you with one simple warning today. Okay? Here's the warning. Don't get too familiar with Jesus. Don't get too familiar with Jesus. Now, that might sound a little funny at first. Like, how, how, how could that be a bad thing, right, to become too familiar with Jesus? Well, I think we've seen it in the flaws of Nazareth today. It doesn't get more familiar than having him grow up with you for, for 30 years in town, right? And yet, look at the problems they had. They detached the goodness of Christ from the true person of Christ. Oh, it makes me so sad. Oh, baby girl. Okay. They had detached the goodness of Christ <laughs> from the true person of Christ. Now, think about our day and age, okay? Think about our day and age. Our postmodern world today is perfectly fine with embracing the good content of Jesus. Right? Everyone wants to cling to the actual wisdom that he produces to some extent, to, to acknowledge the truth of his teachings. Some examples. Everyone, everyone tells you to love your neighbor. Right? Everyone wants you to love your neighbor to some extent, and they fill in the definitions however they want to. Everyone wants you to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We're good with that. Everyone acknowledges the wisdom of common sense logic and human reason. People want to be treated with dignity. People want to, be, to, to, to fight for justice, justice to be served for the weak and the less fortunate. No one wants to be murdered, right? Nobody wants to be murdered. Nobody wants to be cheated on or stolen from or lied to. People don't tend to like that. No one wants to be disrespected or taken advantage of. In other words, everyone wants the blessings and, and benefits of the truth, power, and wisdom of Christ, because every truth we just talked about comes from his word, amen? And yet, our world wants to detach all of those things, all of that goodness, from the true person of Jesus Christ. We want to sever that wisdom from its author and claim it for ourselves. It's the world that we live in. We want the righteousness of God's heaven to saturate our world for us, and then we tell that God to go take a hike. That's the world that we live in. Just like the Nazarenes of our passage today, we live in a world fixed on detaching the goodness of Christ from the true person of Christ. And this is a serious problem that we all have to reckon with, especially as modern Americans who, who, who have been so abundantly saturated and blessed with Christ's truth and wisdom. It's unbelievable. We have to reckon with this. Number two, remember that, that the Nazarenes, their familiarity with Jesus actually blinded them from his true identity. And I think in a similar way, our world today, and especially our nation, our historical moment, has become a little too familiar with the name Jesus. Here's what I mean. He's talked about casually, flippantly. He's, he's mocked. He's memed. He's joked about in the media. He's tamed and domesticated. He's just a, a belittled household name. And we're, we're so unshocked by him, we're so accustomed to his blessings, that, that we've become blind to his true identity. It's almost like Jesus has had a home in the good old USA a little too long. I think we're seeing the fruits of that. Generation after generation is so familiar with him that, that they're actually blinded to who he really is. And this isn't just a problem out there. It's an issue in here as well. Even in the church, we can become dangerously familiar with Jesus. 
We can grow overly accustomed to sitting under the preaching of his word, sermon after sermon after sermon, reading those same passages, hearing those same truths, that same gospel, singing those same old songs, praying those same old prayers. Friends, even we can begin to grow calloused and cold toward the true Christ. Even we can lose sight of who Jesus really is due to our familiarity with him. This is a serious problem that we all have to reckon with, especially those of us who have grown up in the church, constantly surrounded by his word and his people. And finally, remember with Nazareth, remember that when they were, they were finally confronted with Christ's true identity, they were offended by him. They were offended by it. Now think about our day and age. In a similar way, I think it's all too common for people in our world to finally come to grips with the true Jesus and become offended by him. People are finally confronted with their sin and Christ's righteousness. Right? They, they finally have to reckon with his divine claims of being the Son of God. And sadly, so many are offended, they're scandalized, they're, they're tripped up that they reject and turn away from him. And again, this isn't just a problem out there. This is true in local churches all across our land. The modern church is so often preoccupied with a Jesus made in our image. A Jesus who is personable and real and very, very human in the casual sense of the word. People love a Jesus who agrees, just so happens to agree with them all the time. Isn't that crazy? A Jesus who wouldn't hurt a fly. A Jesus who turns a blind eye, kind of winks at sin. Yet when they're confronted with the unfiltered, unadulterated Christ of the Bible... They're utterly offended and even at times disgusted. Remember, Jesus said a prophet receives honor everywhere except in his own town. Emphasis on the prophetic role there as a truth teller on behalf of God. We see this applied to us in, in, in all too frequent embarrassment of the prophet's words. We shy away from those hard passages. We barely touch that archaic Old Testament. Some pastors even teach the masses to just un unhitch the whole thing. Get rid of it. You don't need it. We're shy about God's law. We're embarrassed about God's words about sexuality and holiness and purity and righteousness. We become familiar with a tame Jesus who just so happens to look like us all the time. And then we come face to face with the raw power of the true Christ through his word, by his spirit, and we're, we're offended by it. We're taken back a little bit. We're shocked. It's almost the saltiness is a little too salty, right? Like, please water that down. Saints, this is a serious problem that we all have to reckon with, especially because we are all at risk of falling prey to the spirit of the age. None of us is immune to the sway of culture in this world. And so church family, my word of warning for us this morning is to not become too familiar with Jesus. Don't get too familiar with Jesus. Don't begin to, to detach the goodness of Christ from the person of Christ. It can be so easy for us to benefit from and enjoy his blessings each and every day through his word, through his works in this world and begin to get lazy in attributing those good things where they belong, to him. Right? We need to fight that temptation with faith, giving credit where credit is due. <laughs> if you woke up this morning, it's because the Lord Jesus, from his throne in heaven, did a miraculous work to wake you up this morning. Amen? He did that. If, if, if you made it here to church safely, it's because Jesus saw fit to watch over you every square inch from your bed to this building. Jesus did that. If you've been healed of any sickness or illness whatsoever, it's because the Lord Jesus has graciously extended his healing hand to you. 
And even beyond all of that, if you've ever benefited from any amount of wisdom or truth in this world, in your life, you have none other than the Lord Jesus to thank for that. This is an especially important point for those here, for any here who have not yet repented and believed in Christ. For any unbeliever, under the sound of my voice today, you need to know that every good gift you have ever received has come from God through Christ. You are a rebel sinner against him, and you will be held accountable for your sins, including your embrace, your reception of those good gifts, and your rejection of his person and his lordship. My prayer is that you will cast off your unbelief today and put your trust in Christ, the one who laid his life down on the cross to save his people from their sins. And the point, the point for all of us, though, is that we not get so familiar with Jesus' blessings that we forget that he is the source of those blessings. We need to be reminded daily, daily, to give glory to God for the, for the good things that he does for us. Secondly, for those of us who think we know Jesus well, we need to not allow our familiarity our common knowledge of Jesus' words and his works to slowly begin to grow dull and, and blind us from his true identity. It can be so easy for Scripture, especially familiar passages, to go in one ear and out the other, right? If we're, if we're not careful, we begin to, to believe we have it all figured out and there's not really anything left for us to learn. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. We put our minds and our hearts on autopilot sometimes, and we miss the blessing of freshly interacting with the true Christ every day, being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Saints, we need to fight against that temptation with faith. We need to believe that no matter where we think we are in sanctification, we're only scratching the surface of the mysteries of God and his Christ. Pray to be changed in this very hour, week after week, as we gather as a church, right? Pray to be transformed. Come with an expectation to be transformed. And then throughout the week, open God's word every day with a mind submitted to Christ. Pray that the true Christ would meet with you and reveal himself to you each and every day in your Christian life. And finally, as we close... He reveals himself to us because he will be faithful. He will be faithful to meet with us, won't he, in the gathered assembly each and every day as we study his word. He will be faithful to do that. So when he does, as we're confronted with the true Christ and his true identity in the pages of scripture through the preaching of his word, don't be offended by it. Don't be offended by him as Nazareth was that day. Don't allow your preconceived notions about who you think Jesus is to dictate your reading of his word. Well, the Jesus I worship would never, well, maybe he wouldn't, but maybe he would. Let the word tell you that, right? Well, the, the, my Jesus would never do this or say that. Well, maybe he wouldn't, but maybe he would. Let the words teach you that. The point is let the words on the page shape your understanding of who he really is is and what he's really said and done. Humbly embrace the true Christ of Scripture and allow yourself to be transformed by beholding his glory in a fresh way every day. So saints, don't get too comfortable, too familiar with Jesus. Rather, honor Jesus Christ as the true prophet of God and allow him to teach you who he really is. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we, we ask your forgiveness if in any way we have become complacent, if we have taken for granted the gathered assembly, the reading of your word, the beholding of your face and your truth in the pages of scripture. Lord, if we have in any way become too familiar, help us, Lord. Shake us up. 
wake us up. Draw us to you in a fresh, clear way. Help us never to neglect the truth of who you are and all that you have said and done. I pray that we would be receptive, we would be humble, and we would yield ourselves and our lives to your word and your spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.